Today, let's talk about Nigeria and her wealth. Nigeria being one of those countries on the African continent that has a wide variety of different natural resources. Resources that range from precious metals, various stones, to industrials such as barite, gypsum, coaline, and marble, most of them yet to be exploited. Statistically, the level of exploitation of these minerals is very low in relation to the extent of deposit found in the country. The specific law governing solid minerals exploration and exploitation in Nigeria is the Nigerian Minerals and Mining Act of 2007. This legislation provides the legal framework for the exploration, exploitation and management of solid minerals in the country. Is it going well? Are these minerals benefiting the nation and her people? Newsnight sat down for a conversation with the Minister of Solid Minerals Development, Mr. Oladile Alaki, who speaks to us about what is going on to sanitize the system and to make it more beneficial to the nation and her people. Honorable Minister, thank you for speaking with us on Newsnight. Thank you for having me. You're quite difficult to catch, yet you're so present. And it's, it's the job. I can imagine. That makes that uh, a little <laughs> difficult. It's not imagine. out of non-desire. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, we'll, we'll start out with, uh, what has it been like for you coming to, I mean, if anyone looked at you mm. for, I mean, your antecedents, they'll be thinking, oh, information, communication, not solid minerals. Mm -hmm. What are you doing here? Walking. Mm. <laughs> I get asked that question many times. And, you know, my retort usually is any astute and enterprising journalist is a jack of all trades and master of all. Mm. So if you are in any portfolio at all, the dynamics of journalism, if you've internalized those mm. dynamics, then comes to the fore, and you use the instincts of journalism, you know as well as I do, we operate what we call a deadline pressure, under deadline pressure in journalism. And that means you have to do things efficiently, effectively, and on time. Mm. You can't afford your bulletins to be late. So and you can't afford as a legacy medium to push out fake stories. So your stories must be efficient in terms of its veracity. And then you have to dish it out at the appointed time. Now, that means if you find yourself in any portfolio, you ensure efficiency, you ensure timeliness, and you ensure effectiveness. And those are the general principles for any, any organization. Yeah. Indeed. So let's look at the timeliness of your appearance in the solid minerals in this uh, segment of the, of the Nigerian economy. Hmm. Nigeria, and I actually took our time to list or all the states of this federation, there is no state without a solid mineral. True. And to, for instance, one of the most common minerals, gypsum, practicing in almost all the states, hmm. columbite, hmm. Um, Cowling, Cowling, limestone, all over the place, uh, limestone, gold, mm -hmm. in many states, some undiscovered yet. Mm -hmm. So Nigeria is blessed. Yeah. How is it that we've not seen any benefits, so to speak, from this sector? Very good question. And uh, that was one of the reasons that I gave, even for my appointment by the president. Since 1960 or even before, since oil was discovered in Nigeria and since the petrodollar started uh, coming in, we had an avalanche of it. And what that did to the economy and to the psyche of the average Nigerian was deleterious, was damaging. It made us to become an indulgent and permissive society and nation. It was like free money coming in because we practically did nothing. The oil was there, the prospectors came, drilled, took away and gave us dollars. At some point, 
when one head of state said that uh, the problem of Nigeria wasn't money, but how to spend it. Indeed. And at that time, we were paying the salaries of some countries, True. the civil service salaries of some countries. And then the era of unbridled importation came on. We became a consuming society rather than a producing society. And everybody shut eyes to all other viable sectors of the economy, including the mineral sector. So that's why we are where we are. And so in the last four or five months that we came on, uh, we've tried to redirect attention to this sector. Because number one, we have to diversify the economy away from oil. Necessarily because of what uh, oil is, you know, the trend in, in the global market now. Two is because there is a global clamor for energy transition. The world wants to reduce emission, reduce global uh, warming. Global warming. So, therefore, the energy material used, fossil fuel, like oil and all of that, has to be de-emphasized and the world should transit into cleaner energy and you need the critical metals to, to power this energy clean energy and we have those materials here we have those minerals here so necessary for economic survival we had to redirect our attention to solid minerals and then to be in sync with the global world and trend you know to also join in the, in the, in the uh, reduction of global emission, we also had to redirect our focus to solid minerals. So those two uh, principal factors compelled us into redirecting attention into the solid mineral sector. Not that the solid minerals wasn't there, it was there, but we had free flow of revenue from other from sources. Oil. But incidentally, these mm. minerals have also been consistently mined illegally mm. over time. Mm. And so you now think, saying the, the nations redirecting attention there. Mm. Are you not going to be a conflict with those who have been, in quote, benefiting? Conflict, conflict is not an inhibiting factor. It's a challenge. And challenges are supposed to be surmounted especially when you have uh, you know the political will to do so to do so and the strength of character to withstand whatever inhibitions along the line along your way without challenges where would human beings be so i don't see those things as conflicts i see them as challenges and that's why we are addressing those challenges but what has it been like since you came in there a couple of times you've had to speak out Mm. about the fact that there are so many illegal mining companies in the country. Mm. What has that reaction been like from that side? Of course, naturally, they want to push back. But we, as a government, we cannot fold our arms and allow illegal activities to continue unabated, uncurtailed. That would create much damage to the economy and to the expected windfall as in revenue that we, we you, know, you know we're looking at so we've been taking steps to address uh, the incidents of uh, illegal mining uh, banditry associated with mining uh, terrorism in certain instances and all criminal activities around that sector and that's why it formed was uh, it's, it's rather in one of my uh, seven point agenda which I ruled out on assumption of office, security, and then the menace of illegal mining, curbing that menace. Now, illegal mining is into different categories. You have the artisanal, those lowest on the rung of the ladder, those who just pick minerals on, on the, the surface and, and go and sell. And you have thousands of them. You have those who form themselves into maybe companies and all that and buy from these artisanal miners. Then you have those who go into any community and start digging and mining illegally without the necessary 
uh, licenses, approvals, and all of that. Mm. So illegal mining is in various categories, and uh, we're approaching the problem, you know, segmenting the solutions to address each particular category. For instance, uh, in artisanal mining, the legal activities of artisanal miners, we've encouraged them to form themselves into cooperatives. So they no longer become illegal miners. They become formalized and structured and then bankable. They can approach the banks for financing and all that, expand the scope of their businesses and become legitimate. And through that, government itself can now have bodies or structures to identify and then to tax and collect realities and all that. And these are revenues that had been lost in the past. So that takes care and the result has been quite encouraging. You know, the responses from the artisanal miners forming themselves into cooperatives, you know, the results have been quite encouraging. In the last, uh, say, three months or so that we brought this uh, policy, uh, we've had uh, we have close to about a hundred cooperatives already formed by the so-called illegal artisanal miners. So that's working. Then the companies that go into host communities to start digging or mining illegally without permits and all that, we've read the Riot Act and we're working with the host communities as well. We told them if there is any operator mm. or miner operating illegally in your community, let us know. And then we send in the security agencies. And we've had a few instances that we went and stopped illegal mining. Uh, I don't want to mention the states, but we've carried out operations in some states. In fact, as we speak, some illegal miners that were apprehended have had their accounts frozen and they are being interrogated. And they I think will soon be prosecuted. To the fullness of the law. Of course. Uh, let me say the highest level of this illegal activity are those that are uh, mining with heavy equipment and who have their own private armies. So I, I can imagine the, the amount of revenue the nation is losing. In, it's humongous. In, in certain areas, for instance, gold, as of today, mm. a kilo of gold is about $66,100. That's huge revenue the country could be pulling in mm. from states like Abia, mm. um, Zamfara, Osho. Mm -hmm. How is that even not happening? How can it happen in how many days that will be in office? Mm. You see, sometimes I, I smile at uh, submissions of some people, especially armchair critics and pseudo-analysts. Every government policy has a gestation period. You can't say today we are curbing illegal mining and then tomorrow it's all curbed. Mm. It doesn't work out that way. You said yourself that for years, for decades, these things have been going on. So we came in four or five months ago, put in our policies, put in the measures, now, for every policy, you have to conceptualize it. You have to study that operating environment to even know the kind of solutions you want to profile. All of that will take some time. Even after arriving at the solution, the execution of that solution is another ball game entirely. The financing structure for, to drive that solution also has to be done. And all of these things don't take three days. Well, there are some so, therefore, people have been stealing gold from San Farah from everywhere for decades, like we said. And these are not people, like I said, at various fora. They are not ordinary folks. Some have private armies. So you are not going to go to confront a private army with a ragtag uh, people. You have to also do your homework. You have to gather intel, intelligence, so as to prepare, know the type of arsenal that you need to put in place. In fact, because of the failure, 
and I use that word very responsibly, the failure of the traditional security agencies to curtail that nefarious activity, compel the president to set up an interministerial committee recently on securing the natural resources, which includes the uh, minerals, uh, the, the, the forest uh, resources, and the marine economy. And I chair that meeting, and we've been having uh, a lot of deliberations on this, including and with the service chiefs. And in a short while, we are coming out with a blueprint of a new outfit okay. with intelligence and with technology to combat these activities or criminal activities around the mineral sector. If I, if I may come in here, yeah. we do know that many times when some criminality is going on within an environment, mm. there's a possibility of internal connivance. It's not that there is a possibility. That is always the case. Okay. Now, that in this case happened. now, you've gotten out, you've reached out, or you've been able to arrest some of these legal miners. What about those who have been conniving with them from within the authorities that are supposed to be monitoring and ensuring that illegality ends? That, again, is why we say we are fashioning a new security outfit. Of course, it will com comprise of uh, the various security agencies, you know, it will be an inter-security agency outfit with the forest guards, the N NSDC, uh, the police army, you know, you name it. However, the orientation of this will be different. The kitting will be different. And the training will be exceptional. So that learning from the past learning from the pitfalls of the previous uh, attempts at curtailing this, we put in place new measures to forestall a repeat of what we are talking about, connivance from within the security agencies. Yes, I've had complaints of uh, some uniformed people accompanying illegal miners mm -hmm. to carry out the operation. It, it, it's not even peculiar to the mineral sector anyway. We've had such reports from other sectors as well. So this new security outfit is designed to take care of such problems. You know, each individual that comes in as an officer or as, or as an agent of this new security outfit is going to be totally different in orientation and in value. And this is included in the training manual. I'm, I'm trying to be careful about asking you what is this what's the modality mo modus operandi or what will be the modus right. operandi of this new outfit you're talking about and then the matter of duplication of functions i'm really really holding myself up asking that question but i put it out there oh, no, so because when when we look at things like we have uranium in this country that's a nuclear material and it's not just in one spot it's across the country yeah so what there will is this a ban on that anyway yes you cannot that's, even go out because it's a security metal so you see, but yet there are still some who are coming to steal mm. of that metal. Mm. So what would the modus operandi be of this outfit? And what's not, what's to guarantee that there won't be, um, again, connivance and then crossing into the other outfit to say, okay. in any human endeavor, you cannot vouchsafe that there will be no infractions to every rule the aberrations, right? But what you do is to keep the aberrations very, very low so it doesn't become dysfunctional to the overall system. There's no perfect society anywhere anyway. They are stealing till tomorrow in the US, in UK, in all developed societies. But those criminal activities are stemmed in a way that they do not overtake the good of the general populace. So they do not become dysfunctional in the system. That's what we're striving to do. You cannot say when you have uh, a force of about 100,000 people and to say every single one of them is going to be perfect in terms of morals, in terms of value, in terms of orientation and all that. It's not possible.
However, you ensure that above 80 percent of that population does the right thing but are you going to be recruiting from outside seeing that the police force for instance mm. less than five hundred thousand, mm. the military less than five hundred thousand, um the dss much much lower than that the mm. nscdc less than two hundred and fifty thousand. are you going to be re recruiting into this outfit or you're going to pull from this or it will be both we will both will be recruiting. I will be pulling from the will existing not, agencies. Will that not deplete the already existing bodies? Not necessarily. Them? Don't forget, I said that we are going to inject a large dose of technology in today's security architecture. Technology is it. It's no longer the traditional uh, infantry-like uh, approach. Know, approach. It's not the number of people that you have that really matters. Is the sophistication and efficacy of the gadgets of the technology that you have. For instance, if you were to carry out surveillance on a large expanse of land, you would need like a thousand men to do that. Or a single drone would do that for you. And you get even better, you know, images. You can zero in, zoom in, zoom out, and all that. There are drones that will do that. There's technology there. So it's not the number of personnel that is important here. It is the efficiency and efficacy of even a dynamic and mobile unit that you have supported by technology. Mm -hmm. High end. This unit, uh, unit or this outfit you're talking about here will require a legal backing. Mm -hmm. So are we going to revisit the 2007 Mining Act? No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with the Mining Act. Don't forget, I said, this outfit is to secure the natural resources, not necessarily minerals. Minerals inclusive, the marine economy, and the forests. Okay. Yes. So it has nothing to do with uh, the Mining Act. Okay. And in any case, devising a new security outfit is not necessarily... Uh, uh, legislative uh, affair. This is executive function. The legislature has done its own job. They have uh, fashioned out the Mining Act, which governs all activities surrounding the mineral sector. Now, the Constitution has also established the Nigerian Police, Nigerian Army, Nigeria. Yeah, so, we're not going to be bothering ourselves with all the bureaucratic uh, labyrinth. No, this is an executive function and is a response to an emergency situation. So, are you in, are you implying that it's going to be subsumed under one of these other existing outfits, or would it would there be an executive uh, bill to the legislature to say okay? All of that will be fast tracked if even is necessary at the end of the day. But as at now, I do not see that. Why? Why would you think it's not necessary, seeing that most of what is going on in terms of mining? Because, because I did tell you that it will be an inter-security agency affair. Yeah. Uh -huh. So when you set up a task force, for instance, you don't need any legislative backing for that. Like there's a task force for environment, a task force for this, a task force for that. You don't need any legislative action to back that up. So it's going to be carved out like that. Mm. Let's look at that mining act you talked about earlier. Is there a possibility that the, the gaps that may be existent in that act have given room to this much of illegality in the sector? No, not at all. Did the act covering the oil sector give room for the kind of militancy that we've experienced in the Niger Delta? No. There are certain things that are contingent of, on human inclination. Whether you have the best laws or regulations, it will not deter whoever is criminally inclined. And in any case, if laws were to be so efficient in curbing criminality, we won't have criminality anywhere because there are laws and laws and the litany of laws. Mm and regulations everywhere. But people still go around circumventing all of this. It's a human inclination and tendency. Of course, there are also extraneous factors 
depending on what the economy is saying and all of that. But laws and regulations don't really uh, create a kind of total absence of criminality. No. They are to regulate society, yes, uh, create a ground norm of behavior, control or, or, or adjust human behavioral pattern. But it does not in itself intrinsically curb anybody who has a criminal uh, tendency. So far, we've just been talking about what you've come to meet on ground and what the thinking of the Nigerians out there has been. But let's go back to the laws guarding this sector. That's the Minerals and Mining Act of 2007. Now, I know I asked you earlier, mm. are you going to be looking at how to mm -hmm. amend certain mm -hmm. sections for mm -hmm. maybe to enhance operations or to ease inflows or to ease possibly licensing and permissions mm -hmm. to operate? Would you be looking mm -hmm. at that? Yes, we are looking at the whole gamut of uh, the clauses affecting uh, the sector in the, in the mining. This, this mining act was uh, enacted in 2007, yes. you know. So uh, it's not uh, at par with modern realities and, and current trends in, in the sector. So we are reviewing. In fact, it's in the process of review right now uh, in conjunction with the House of uh, uh, Representatives. The yes, the National Assembly is looking at it. Um, even on the 12th and 13th of this month, there will be a public uh, um, uh, debate, yeah. you know, uh, uh, on that particular uh, review of the Mining Act. So, um, I also wouldn't want to divulge a lot of the things that we are, you know, putting in place. Mm -hmm. But we have reviewed it. We have seen some shortfalls. We have seen some stale areas uh, that we are tinkering with. Uh, one uh, area that is quite uh, important to me personally is the accommodation with, of the host communities, you know, carrying the host communities along in the operations. Because this has uh, led to a lot of frictions between operators and the host communities in the past. And um, in the old act, you, you could get your license and approvals before obtaining the consent of the host communities. So we're changing that now, that ab initio, you have to obtain the consent. After identifying your site, then you obtain the consent of the host communities before even applying for, for your license, you know, and before we can give approval. So it's a, now a precondition rather than after the fact. Mm. And that would mean that the operator must have sought the endorsement of the host communities before uh, obtaining approval from the Federal Ministry of Solid Minerals mm. for, for license. Mm. And this will go a long way in reducing, you know, whatever problems uh, between operators and the host communities, also which led in part to some insecurity issues. Because I've had occasions uh, or reports of host communities engineering insecurity against operators because of disagreements. You're right. Mm. So, well, we believe that if the, the endorsement of the host communities uh, uh, is obtained before approval, uh, the incidence of friction will reduce substantially. Uh, so, we are putting that in the new thing. I, I'm particularly interested in the aspect of this act that affects the environment. Mm. We've heard of cases of lead poisoning in, in places like Zampa and all of that. Would that also be considered, especially in this time when we talk about environmental protection, climate change and all of that? Mm. Environmental protection is in the act. I know. Yes. And, and as you said, it's not. It's 2007. Mm. We did not have ozone layer depletion as high as it is now. Mm. It, it, it actually it doesn't really need to spell out every environmental hazard as long as there's an omnibus you know the operative word is environmental uh, you know hazard the problem or disaster there is a clause that takes care of that 
Beyond that, there is Miremko in every state, which is a committee put in place in every state to monitor all activities around the mines in all states, including environmental issues. And they take all of these things up, they report. And as part of our inclusion strategies with the host communities, with the states, there are about 10 or 11 members of this committee in all states. The state governor of every state recommends the chairman of that committee and the minister approves. Not only that, the state governor appoints not less than five to six members of that committee, including the chairman. So therefore, we've given them this leeway because they are the closest to the sites. They are like the host communities. So that clause is to carry them along and involve them, engage them in the day-to-day -day, you know, uh, monitoring and, and uh, uh, running of these sites. So what would you say to those who are clamoring that these mineral rights should actually be given to the state instead of the federal so that they mine and they pay taxes to the federal? So why don't we give the oil to the oil states and let them pay to the federal? So what's wrong with doing it that way? And in, isn't that what it was before? Was it At a certain time that? where the different regions were doing their thing and paying taxes to the federal. There Shouldn't was that... no oil then. There wasn't oil then. And there wasn't solid minerals then. Mm -hmm. It was basically agrarian. The only thing that the smack of uh, industrial was the coal in the east. So if we could do that when we were agrarian, now that we know we have so much. The structure of the political system was different. Then you had a parliamentary system of government. Now we have a presidential, that's one. Two, the constitution was different. The constitution at that time gave semi-autonomy to the regions. We had three major regions then, the north, east, and south, uh, east and west, right? I recall, well, I, I, I read that even in western region, when Obafemi Awolowo was running the place, western region had its own mission in UK. Mm. It had its own constitution. It had its own uh, coat of arms. All the paraphernalia of autonomy or semi-autonomy were there also in the constitution. But all of that changed. We operated a truly federal constitution at the time. But all of that changed in, since 1966. And can't, shouldn't we consider going back to a truly federal constitution? You and I can't do that sitting down here it's a process and it's a mindset mm. and that's why i say when every part of the country feels a sense of belonging and owes an allegiance to the nation they will think and act correctly what our founding fathers did with the constitution they operated at that time, which also brought that true federalism, is essentially what we should do. However, between then and now, a lot of water passed under the bridge. So you have to be able to amend the constitution. That's what some people call restructuring, the clamor for restructuring. I agree with restructuring. Personally, I have fought for it. I've written tons of newsprint on it. I've been part of a movement that has been clamoring for it. Even when we were in government in Lagos under this present president, we fought the federal government severally up to Supreme Court. Indeed, we do. And we won that. all the cases on federalism. And I can reel out those cases which today form the fulcrum or bedrock 
of today's federalism that we practice. But how many of us out of 36 states had the guts to confront the, the federal government at that time but and they were in opposition? But they say there's only one person that can build a cat at any point okay, in time. Okay, after we built the <laughs> cat, how many followed suit? I recall the issue of local governments when we created additional local governments in Lagos State under this our present president. In fact, it will interest you to know that we were five states that created local governments at yes. the same time. And then the federal government, led by Obasanjo, wielded its big stick and withheld the revenue accruing to the local government. And four other states fell back and said, well, they didn't have the guts to go ahead. We went ahead, led by this president. And for over two years, the revenue of the, of the, of the local governments were held back. And what did we do? We were just creative in managing the state. So it, until every one of us developed that mindset mm. and identify the point that this is where we should be, then it will be easier to carry everybody but along. Mr. Lucky, I know we were if talking, we don't, uh, we're talking solid minerals here, but yes, now that we've gone this way, one would, one would say, mm. seeing that the president was the one man that stood this ground to say mm. Lagos mm -hmm. is a federating unit right. in Nigeria. So these are the rights of Lagos mm -hmm. as a state and a government. Mm -hmm. One would think that now that he's president, this will be one of the first and major things we'll be pursuing. As Why government. he's pursuing it, but he's not a legislative, he's not, he's, he cannot legislate it. No, but he can send an executive document to the, to the National Assembly to start the process, can't he? No, no. Or shouldn't it he begin work to... work out that way. It doesn't work out. That's why I call some of you anti critics. <laughs> you need to get into the frame. Okay. You, know, you see... So walk us to the process of what can be done in this tell you, There are different approaches. The one thing you would identify as the president's desire to pursue this is via a question I will ask you. Since this president assumed office, have you ever heard of an altercation between him or between the federal government and a state on constitutional issues. No. Have you ever heard that he had guided or denied a state its rights since he assumed office? No. There are nuances. Those are nuances, what we call in layman's terms, body language, to show that this is not the type of president that will practice unitarism. This is the type of president that subscribes to true federalism. Take this issue of minerals that we are talking about. When states start to say, oh, it's uh, in our backyard and all that, oh, blah, 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 blah. Even one or two states went ahead to make policy pronouncements on minerals. And I came out and I objected. I objected in principle based on the constitution that we are still practicing. And I said, look, this is in the exclusive legislative list. You don't have any authority to make pronouncement, policy pronouncements on it. Now, if there are any issues in your state that you feel are untoward or whatever, you report to the federal ministry in charge of such an issue. And if the ministry does not take action, you report to the president, right? However, to even further reduce such frictions, I had a meeting with the governors and the governor's forum and their chairman who was, who was there, all of them, and we discussed these issues. It so happened that one of the states or one of the governors that made the policy pronouncements, when I explained the issues to him, constitutional limitations and all that, didn't even know about it. And of course, he apologized that, oh, he overstepped his bounds. But I said that 
any state that is interested in getting into mining should feel free to apply for license and it will be approved. And I've approved a couple here on this table for states. Now that is federalism keep creeping in. True federalism. Without fanfare, without rancor. There's so many ways to skin a cat. Now, there's another pathway that will raise all hell. And if you are not circumspect, it will be DOA, dead on arrival, because of the geopolitical configuration of the country. So you must be strategic and tactical in your approaches. But the objective remains in focus. So in doing this now, how, how do you balance, this is a delicate act. So the federal government or the nation Nigeria owns the minerals under the earth. But the Land Use Act gives sole ownership, so to speak, of the land mm -hmm. to the state governors. Mm -hmm. So how do you, where's the, where's the meeting point? In our it's very simple. You can own the land, you don't own the minerals. So you can't mine it without obtaining the necessary approvals from the constituting authority in charge of such a mineral or whatever it is. However, I just told you to minimize such frictions. I just said states are free to apply and obtain licenses to mine whatever it is in their domain that they want to mine. And they paid, once they meet the criteria, they obtain the approval, they pay the necessary royalties and taxes to the federal. And we're moving gradually towards the true federalism you are talking about without the accompanying or attendant rancor. Of course, these artisanal miners that we spoke of, we need to also farm them up so that serious investors can come into play. Don't forget that in the November, or early December, I revoked 1,633 licenses. Defaulting licenses, those who refused or failed to pay up their dues and, 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 and other royalties or the necessary obligations that they should do to the government, they failed to do that. So we cleared them off. And that's injecting sanity into that in a few more days, I'm going to revoke more those that are dormant. Because mm. some people collected licenses and did nothing with it, blocking the space for potential serious investors. So I'm going to clear more than a thousand in a few days so as to inject sanity, create the space for serious people. Where we are marketing, we are inviting local and foreign investors to come into the fray. But if all the licenses had been clogged up by all serious people, then it will be counterproductive. So we have to clear all of that. So we're taking this and so many other steps to ensure that we put this sector on a higher pedestal than we met it. It will not only contribute 10%, 20% and all of that, it will overtake the oil. That is our objective in terms of contribution to the gross domestic product of Nigeria. God being our helper, we intend to do this. We we'll look forward to that. Thank Again, you. that matter in Ibadan, that explosion, um, the governor was quoted as saying it's illegal miners that caused this to happen. And I did say that we're not going to make any categorical statement until we've examined all the forensic analysis that are going on by the security agencies and the intelligence services. Until then, it will be, like I said, presumptuous to say this is the cause or this is a No, we need to wait for the forensic analysis and then we can attribute the cost to whatever. Yes, there are speculations. Yes, there are preliminary uh, ideas of how it happened. For instance, the the explosives were stored in a, in a residential area. And I did say in Ibadan that I was shocked that even that place 
was not a slum or is not a slum. It's a highbrow area of Ibadan where supposedly enlightened people live. And how someone could be storing explosives in that kind of highbrow area for years undetected without anybody in the vicinity making a report to the authorities. That really boggled my mind. And it speaks to the kind of mentality that we have in this country. As a people, it's easy to point accusing fingers at leaders. What about us, the followers? Do we really do what we are supposed to do or discharge our obligations? We are supposed to be our brother's keeper. In fact, we are supposed to be our own keepers. <laughs> right. No. So if, if someone is storing explosives, there is no... The explosives are not invisible. Trucks must be bringing those materials into that uh, residence uh, for years, maybe on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. So some people would have been seeing some suspicious movement. Nobody reported. And you have lawyers, SAS, in that vicinity and other enlightened people. So the security agencies too, they rely on information to act. When they are not giving the information, then we turn around to blame them. They are, they are not alive to responsibilities. So it takes all to tango. It takes all of us discharging our obligations in our own little spaces to make the whole. And when you say leadership, yes, every, you can point to, the, to leadership as a problem. I agree with you. But the followership is also not a solution, especially in our own milieu. And I, did, I do say to people that since 1960 that we obtained independence, I do not recall a, a time that we went to Ghana to recruit a set of leaders or that we went outside Nigeria to recruit a set of leaders. So from 1960 till date, successive leadership has always come from amongst us Nigerians. And we still say the same thing. Oh, these leaders, oh, they are bad. Oh, they are bad. What does that tell you as a social scientist? That maybe there's something wrong with the DNA of the average Nigerian. Mm. At all levels, local government, family, state, federal, every, it's been drawn from the pool of Nigerians. Successively. That's something that's food for thought, indeed. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you. Pleasure. An interesting conversation, you might say, that we've had there. We'll look forward to hearing from you. The handles are right there on your screen. Send us a comment, send us a tweet. All right, the addresses are there on your screen. But know this that you can watch these again and other conversations we've had on YouTube or via our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast, you get to see these episodes and other episodes of these conversations we've had. Till we come your way again, it's all saying goodbye.